Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not a good clock watcher. I'll have a clock out so you start doing this and I have only an, hour, only an hour left. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, this, uh, I really didn't know I should have called you more to get a better idea of who you people would be. And I, I guess I, uh, is in a lot of my thinking and planning, I guess I was thinking for teachers that only taught a year or two, and I guess some of you have. But this is an impressive group and, and impressive credentials for this group. So in my mind, I'm trying to do a lot of shifting around here with all that stuff I set up all night, night after night after night playing. <laughs> uh, several, several, several years ago, there was a music store in this town called J.W. Pepper. They still exist in Atlanta. But there was a store here and uh, band directors among Coral or other people. But we'd flock there and at different times of the year you'd see different people there for different reasons. And of course, solo and ensemble is always a big task to get all that stuff done. And I don't know if any of you knew Bill Miller in Lakeland, a very large personality and a very large person that carried it around. But he was a character and he was a trumpet player. And so there was, I don't know, 15 or 20 band, we didn't come as a group, but we all end up there because we're all looking for a solo and song. And so one day he just screamed out in the store and he says, I find, finally found it. Here is a trumpet solo you can play with two fingers. And so that really excited me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the kid that plays that, then two fingers is enough. But in leadership, like playing trumpet or anything else, anything, there's the fundamentals of. And if you don't cover the fundamentals, you may get by being slack on some of them for a while, but you eventually find that solo where you gotta use that third finger. And that's a real trap to walk into because you can have a lot of success and not necessarily know where you're lacking. Does that make sense? And so one of the things, I mean, and, and I believe, I believe in fundamentals. I, 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 I think you live or die by them. And, uh, and the sports guys talk about that all the time. How do you win? Fundamentals. And I don't know how many times I would, when I was teaching high school, uh, even some at college, but the kids would come in and they'd say, can you help me with the Weber concertino? And I'd say, well, let's, let me hear it. Well, they had a non-existent armature. Yeah, I mean, there's no need to go on. That's got to be fixed. <laughs> fixed. And so the thing about it is, one of the responsibilities you have as a leader is to take inventory of yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, what you know and what you don't know. But sometimes we often don't know what we don't know. And so one of the best ways to cover those bus, uh, bases is uh, studying, reading leadership books. So may I ask you, if, if I hope this is a positive, how many of you here have read leadership books? Good, good. And, and you, uh, you can't do that too much. And you can't read too many even though they all basically kind of say the same thing, but they say it with different emphasis, different subtleties, and they use different stories. I mean, those books are fun to read uh, because of the truth they hold first, and then the, the stories, because the stories latch on to us. You know, and I, and I, I love those stories, and it keeps you to remember that uh, issue and, and one pops in my mind. My favorite uh, writer of leadership book is Warren Bennis. I assume he's still al alive. He's very old. He years ago was president of University of Cincinnati and he has been in the leadership and his books are marvelous. And uh, I read a lot of other people but I always go back. And before coming here I went back and read and it's like have I already read this? <laughs> you know, you get it a little further back down. And so, uh, but just to give you an example, if you're not familiar with those stories, 
he was talking about the authority that a person in a leadership position has. Now, not the boss thing, you do what I tell you because I'm your boss, but you've got to have a certain amount of authority if you're running the meetings, etc. So he tells the story of the baseball game and the pitcher's here and the batter's here and the catcher's here and the umpire's back here. And so the ball comes down through, the batter doesn't swing, and the umpire hesitated a second. So the catcher spun around and said, well, what was it? He said, it's nothing until I call it. All right? And you don't let anybody push you into bad decisions when the authority is really yours. You know, and, and those kind of, that, not only do you learn a lot from that, I think they're fun and I think they're inspiring because a leader has got a world of stuff to do. So I would, you know, Warren Bennis uh, has written a lot. The, the first book his I read was On Becoming a Leader. And uh, the second book, Interesting Why Leaders Can't Lead, which is a commentary on our society for the past several years. I mean, for example, what leader can fix the problem between Democrats and Republicans in the Congress right now? Right? You know, and so that's a big part of it. Well, anyway, to talk about those books is to set you up to say for anybody that doesn't know that leadership is a skill. And any and everyone can learn those skills if they study, think, and work at it. So it's not, I mean, Bennis insists in all the leaders he worked with that leaders are not born, they're made. And mostly of their own doing. You make yourself the leader by observing, by thinking, by talking to people, by reading about it again and again and again just like teaching, right? Tell them one time, they don't get it, do they? Again and again. And so, but those books are not difficult. They're fun to read, and they're not difficult to read. And uh, they, uh, they will do for you what you need to have done. And uh, so I, I recommend that you do that. They also agreed, and I want you to all listen to this because this is one of the things you have to sit and think about for a while. He, they also, all, he, had a, he did a whole study with all kinds of leaders from sports and business and med everything. Big identified group of people. But anyway, they, those people all agree that no leader sets out to be a leader per se, but rather what they want to do is express themselves freely and fully. That is, leaders have no interest in proving themselves, but an abiding interest in expressing themselves. And, and you, you can think about that a little bit. I'm sure you've all been in meetings and clinics, and you think, yeah, I know the answer to that, or I know a answer to that, and you just, your heart about first because you want to say it, but then you're not running the meeting and all that stuff. But leadership comes out of that need to express yourself. And, and I think that's a good thing. I, I, I've been president, and accountant of the FBA and the FME, I've been president of five things. And I'll just kind of throw this as an aside. Those are all six year gigs. That was 30 years <laughs> at the post. And that didn't mean I got any better than anybody else, but I did, while well, I was in that uh, arena that many times. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, if I had set out to accomplish that goal, I could never have done that. I could never jump up and me and say, hey, hey, I want to be president of FBA. No, if you build your credibility, and you build all that is implied in your credibility, your personality, the way you think, the way you talk, the ideas you have, and you've got to be on the scene. <laughs> I mean, I, I've 
gone to so many, if I just take the money that I've spent going to conventions, I, I could buy a new Kia or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, you know, the reason I wouldn't miss a clinic if I could possibly not miss it, I was afraid I'd miss out on something. I hate that when people come back and say, hey, man, did you hear so-and-so? No. I missed it. And, and I also made my schedule fit the convention as much as I could. I mean, you just can't learn too much. And if you're not on the scene, you don't have a chance to be a part of conversations, et cetera. And if you'd been younger, I would, I would have told you the story about when I first was elected to the, the board as district chairman of Florida Bandmasters. <laughs> Went to the first meeting, and I didn't hardly know a soul there. But what I did was I studied who had the authority on that board. The chairman didn't have so much, but, you know, there are certain people that just command that. You understand, right? And so they would be dealing with a problem, and I'd think, well, here's the answer to that. And I tried and fell flat. They didn't know me. <coughs> I hadn't built credibility. So then I figured out after a while who did. Sitting right here next to me was Lewis Jones. <laughs> he had this G voice. And so what I did, I would say, and we didn't know each other, but he was smart enough to listen to somebody, and hey, Lewis. What we ought to do is this. He said, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And it would pass just like that. And the thing about it is, and I've always been this way, it didn't matter where the idea came from me or Gene Autry or somebody. <laughs> it's the idea that we're interested in getting done. And if you worry about who gets the credit, then that's something. So the excitement of thinking and, and sometimes my idea was probably wrong, and they probably didn't pass it. But, you know, you know how many people you deal with out there that don't think? <laughs> <laughs> Just don't think? And so when, and I may jump around here, but when Mary was talking about this thing of uh, what can you do, et cetera, you know, it's, it's hard to, increase your intelligence, but you can over time. But it's hard by tomorrow or Monday, right? But one thing you can change is your awareness. And so when after I was president of FBA, and there was a lot of stuff, I was lucky, we got a lot of stuff done. I mean, a ton, like revamped the entire organization. All that stuff. And so uh, one of the later elected presidents called me up and said, I want you to tell me something. How, how did you come up with all that stuff you did? And I didn't know how to answer that. And uh, I, I, what it was is, is being a person that's aware and cares about things. I mean, I, when I was teaching at Stetson and doing interns, I visited many, many schools. And then other ways I visited schools to rehearsals and stuff. Every time I walked on a high school campus, I could not but notice <coughs> the condition of the building mm -hmm. and the behavior of students and the organization or lack of wherever. I could not see it, right? And when I saw it, I imagined what could be done to correct that. And I've thought about that so many times and then one day, I particularly got this from, uh, Robert knows this, I have a no hat rule in band rehearsal. I mean, if a kid wants to go to the beyond early, all he's gotta do, is not in my rehearsal, all he's gotta do is walk through the door, or thinking about walking through the door. I mean, if Stetson, it got to where I could be walking across the campus and I would see that out of the corner of my eye, a kid outdoors, 50 yards over here, they would see me and go, <laughs> all right, because no hats. So when I go out and do honor bands, I tell the chairman, get rid of those hats. And then I'll go in there, and there's two or three hats on. I said, I got to get those hats. 
And the reason I have to have the hats gone is not because it's not real. I can't rehearse because I can't see you stop seeing those hats. Awareness. I cannot not see them. But then I realize people don't see it because they don't care that much. They don't, you know, I mean, there's a school not too, well, not too far from where we live, that you walk down the sidewalk and there is a old, flatted out piece of chewing gum, just about every dot that you can possibly see. It's been there since I've been here. And I think, are you kidding me? But if it doesn't bother you, and so when you, if you're aware, I mean, if you're walking through a, a neighborhood and you see a house over here that's about to fall down, you think, what? Well, you see it because it's not the way a house is supposed to be. You've got to have an ethic that things should be correct if they can. You don't go nuts about them, but you are aware, and you can imagine, well, what would it take? Well, call a contractor, you know, do something. And so when you get further and further into your career, then you start seeing more and more if you're seeing it, if you're aware. But you need to take your inventory and seeing it will give you what needs to be done. And then Venice says, when you really understand the problem, the answer will most likely appear to you, the solution, the strategy. And I do believe that. You just have to spend enough time on that. Have I already run over? No, okay, let me, t let me tell you this story because this, you know, the stories have different levels of dimension and drama and intensity. And I don't want you to misunderstand. Let me tell the whole story before you misunderstand. But I was in, in graduate school at Florida State when I was 54 years old. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm in class there with some of my students, which was all right. <laughs> but, and so I was a, a student of Cliff Matson, uh, And so we spent a good bit of time, because I was a doctoral student, and with your major professor, you spend all kinds of time. So as he was talking one day, he said to me, you know, he said about the only thing in my adult life I've not really been able to figure out is how time works. What is time? Well, that was, for me, that's like throwing raw meat to a shark. I'm like a two-year-old, oh, I'll, I'll figure that out, I'll tell them. <laughs> and so I didn't spend a lot of conscious time thinking about it, but it was in there working all the time. And so I always carried with me a legal pad in my car and pen, because all kind of stuff comes to it. So I'm <laughs> driving into the campus one day, and uh, it was like that. So I pulled over, and I wrote out as fast as I could write about six pages, and therefore time is this. That's kind of fun, right? <laughs> I don't believe in drinking water, but I have the, the old man's disease dry mouth. <laughs> know it's open, it's dry. Uh, so anyway, so I came bursting in, knocked on the door, ah! I go in, I said, uh, I figured out what time is it. Oh, heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets up and starts making his little cup of instant decaf or whatever, and so, and then he says, all right, right, like this, right, tell me. So I said, I've got to read it because I couldn't hold that in my mind, that string all the way down. So I did it, and he just sat there and looked at me. So finally the pressure, I had to say, well, what do you think? He said, well, that's pretty much what Aristotle said it was. Now, here's what, don't be confused. He wasn't confusing me with Aristotle, and, and I'm not as smart as even Aristotle's neighbor but the point is, if you gave that assignment to every person in this room and you really spent the time on it, you would all come up pretty much with the answer that Aristotle provided the world. Because how many, how many choices would there be? A million? No. 
and you work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it, and you'll pretty much get to the same place. And that's the reason Bennett says, like other people, you can learn just about anything you want to learn, but you have to spend time. And it, there's not enough time here, but the power of the subconscious mind is amazing. The, uh, uh, what was Newton's first name? Isaac, Isaac Newton, Isaac. yeah. You know, when somebody asked him one time when he was older, he says, how were you able to accomplish all those things? And he said, I kept those ideas before my mind all the time. Which goes back to another thing, leadership is not something you do at the meeting or on weekends. You're a leader all the time. You live like a leader, you think like a leader, you respond like a leader, you observe like a leader. And so if a person, you've seen those people, that out in the hall, they're ridiculous. All of a sudden they bound in the room. Okay, let's everybody get settled down. I'm the leader, pay attention. I don't think so. Do you? You're aware of what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? You know, your credibility is made every time you're anywhere doing anything you're doing. And that really puts a stress on music teachers because I tell you what, if you have a bad elementary chorus, high school chorus, high school orchestra, high school band, and it's going out to festival and bottoming out, you're not going to leave music people. Isn't that true? That's one of the first things I noticed coming to Florida. And you didn't strive to be a great band director so you could become a leader, but if you really rang the bell with your ensemble, they would find you. Hey, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. And that's the right way. <coughs> I've said two things that you need to do for wherever you are in this process. And one is to read a lot of books, not just leadership books, everything. And I think the two most fundamental books for any person is philosophy and behavior. What people should think and how they should behave and why they should behave that way and how that what you can do affects behavior as Matson always said, behavior is true. That's the reason if you want to hire or engage a person to be a leader of a committee, you want to know who they are, or just go out and watch them for a while. They'll tell you in a heartbeat who they are. So you need to read a lot of stuff. Uh, I read, I read a lot. And that's not blowing a horn, but I mean, the further I got into leadership positions, the more I had to write, and the more I, I learned this from Emerson. When you have something on your mind, you see it everywhere you go. I don't know when I ever had to research anything for anything, because already in my files, I had all that stuff. I read it in the paper, scratch it out, cut it out, and it goes in there. Somehow I remember that. And, uh, and so that gives you a lot of depth as a person. And then when you're to address somebody, then you have something to say that will change the rhythm of the talk and lighten things up a little bit or then make things more serious. So one thing is you need to get excited about ideas that you read. Sometimes, and I did this with my classes, I would tell them what I thought was an incredibly inspiring story. And they're all sitting there like, <laughs> I'm thinking, did you not hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. You mean that didn't excite you, you at all? And so one of the things, being a leader connecting with people, and you learned a master class here with Dr. Palmer is, you've got to be an expressive person. You know, you got to look at people you're talking to. And if you say something funny, you go, hey, <laughs> you know, you're, you're interacting with your behavior rather than what? Passive. And passive is not a uh, condition of leadership anywhere, I don't think. Does that make sense? Say, oh, yes, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. 
Glad we learned that today, yeah. But it's true, isn't it? Don't you like that from your kids? You know, with with my, of course, I'm a few years older than I was, 70 or 80 years ago, but when, when I conducted my band, I, I quit telling jokes. They don't get them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that's not my fault, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I try to tell some of them, just be nice and laugh anyway. You don't have to actually get the joke to be a nice person and, and laugh. Uh, so, you know, some of the things to do is take responsibility for your own, your own uh, professionalism, your own leadership, your own learning, and, and don't, don't give excuses for why you don't have something done. Nobody is interested in that. And again, if you're at task on this all the time, then any holes you have in the background, and I can assure you, not only you have those, I still have those holes. But that's good news. It's exciting to think, heavenly days, how could I have missed that? But now I got, I can kind of understand that. Is anybody dying to say anything like it's time for the break or you know, we used to say, smoke them if you got them, but we don't do that anymore, do we? <laughs> now, that's a chuckle. Let's see. <laughs> so the thing of being aware, credibility, and then the first thing that they, the first, if you, if you get a signed a committee uh, to do a, a, a project and you've been assigned a leader, what is the first thing? You've got to do. Just let me know. When I, I have no idea. Just, what is the first thing you got to do? Delegate. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I shouldn't have asked that because then now I've got to say, well, not quite. And that's the negative. I, I screwed up right there. But I won't do that again. But anyway, the first bit, I'm telling you what Ben has said, and I'll agree with you. But the first thing is to define the mission. What is it we're going to do? And usually comes with that why. And, and is the, this mission a doable? Who was used to talk about doable deeds? Was that whoever it was? Mary, Mary. yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's this person, that's two screw ups in a row. One more and I'll be going to the car. Uh, uh, yeah, doable deeds. I mean, when you define the mission, that if you tell them, all right, what we wanna do here and this weekend, we wanna, get a rocket ship that'll go to Mars and they'll look at you like you're crazy and you would be. You know, it's gotta be dual, it's gotta be reasonable compared to time, resources, all that stuff. But that's what the leader's gotta do. Then when you decide to define the mission, you've got to be able to engage your followers in the belief, in the excitement of that. If they're not excited about it, they're not gonna do a very good job. And then, as you delegate, that was you, right? Here, okay. When you start slicing up the work, then what you get into really sensitive uh, people skills. And you need to take inventory of the people you're gonna be working with to see what skills they bring to the, to the project. You know, do you, everybody hear that, right? Because, you know, it, if, if uh, if you say, okay, we're going to produce this handbook, and, and I want you to, to design the cover, and I want you to do the index, and I want you to, and, then, and they're thinking, <clears throat> I've been designing covers for the last 10 years, and now I, I can't draw on my best self, and so you need to know what's there, and then feel them out a little bit. My favorite story about that was in World War II. It, they, the Kentuckians tell this, but I'm a Kentuckian. And so they're not very reliable for truth things. But <laughs> they tell this, still this day in Kentucky, that at the University of Kentucky during WW2, which started after I was born, and it was the Great War, which I'm proud that I was here. That's <laughs> chuckle too, see. <laughs> Y'all don't hear the older generation talk about World War II as that was the Great War. Oh yeah, yeah, we saved the whole world. They did. I was crawling around in the crib. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, they used, took over part of the campus for officer training for the Army. 
So this one guy, he's teaching math to these guys that are in officer training. And he obviously has this one guy sitting over here who spends every class period looking out the window. And so, you know, these are all people going to school to become officers. And you got somebody back here not paying attention. So he finally says, you got to talk to me about this. How come you don't have, why aren't you, you going to fail this class? He said, no, no, no. He said, I won't fail it. He said, you see that book you're teaching out of? He said, I wrote that book. <laughs> That'll set you back a little more. And whether it happened or not, it could have. Because if a leader comes in and assumes, but what you want to do is you want to line people up with the jobs that they would like to have and that they, you know they're qualified for, they know they're qualified, and then they can get excited about it. And nobody likes to just be thrown a bone. All right, you take care of this, you take care of this, you take care of this. Nobody likes that. It devalues the person. It's insulting. So that's, I mean, there is a lot of work to this. But then again, there's those things that lots of people don't want to do, but somebody has to. Then it's like when I was at Leon. Okay, Leon one year, when I could look back at the low brass section and remember when every one of them came into that program, every one of them is a saxophone player. No, I'm not putting down saxophone players, but, I mean, <laughs> but that's what they were. And so when I told them, we're not a band. We can't be a band until you give up what you want. So you've got to sell them on the idea. But anyway, I could go on and on and on and on, but I appreciate you listening. And uh, now, when I tell jokes in the state, and I tell a lot of jokes, and most of them are good except for my band, then I tell them, if you have any stuff in you at all, then you give Adams credit for having told the joke. I don't want you to take my joke and go out in the hall and make people think you're funny because I was one. But <laughs> well, you guys can use any of these stories and not give me credit. So there is a gift for you. All right, thank you.